All right, everybody, welcome again to the production channel where we bring you the latest and greatest uh, going on around uh, this amazing industry, which is uh, the production industry. And we bring you audio, video, broadcast, uh, worship, sports news, the whole thing. Uh, and today, you know, I'm really, really excited uh, to have our guest, Bob Murdoch. Bob, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Bob is, uh, you know, Background is really 20 years in broadcast news, 17 years uh, in live events, so he's certainly seen some stuff. Um, but before we get into that, uh, again, I'm always co-hosting with uh, Clem Herod. Clem, my friend. Yo, Welcome, buddy. what's going on, Bozy? Eh, not too much, man. Um, we're getting the hang of this now, aren't we? I, this is now like number four or five, I think. I already. mean, we are rolling through them. We are rolling through them, having a good time, bringing the voice of our industry out to the public you know it's such a niche industry that we're in and we see each other so few and far between why not allow an opportunity for all of us to get together in one common area to share our stories share our lives talk about how we got started talk about where we want our lives and our careers to go where we would like the industry to go just so much is discussed on the production channel that's it, man. And uh, honestly, today's cool because it's different. It's something we haven't done yet to, uh, before. Um, Bob uh, has got really just uh, an extended history um, playing more in that sort of like vendor, supplier, and manager role. Not to say that he's hasn't slung some uh, road cases around and loaded in some shows himself, but it's just uh, that's that's what's really exciting today is we, we've talked about, you know, we've talked with audio techs, we've talked with lighting designers, um, video and projection, uh, and even show callers, but today really bringing in someone who's uh, seeing this a little bit more from um, that kind of higher view of I see hundreds, if not thousands of events go through a year. I've been on the rental and logistics side. I've been on the uh, manufacturing side. So, and now on the training side. Have, that's right. And now even on the training side, which is awesome. So yeah. um, I'll get us I'll get us going here. Um, Bob, you know, again, welcome. And yeah, so specifically, talk to us a little bit about where you are right now. Talk to us about Evolve Media Group and your role there as the National Director of Education. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, uh, Evolve Media Group is a, a company. It's, it's not a very old company, only been around uh, probably six, seven, eight years. Um, but it's um, dedicated to very high-end video equipment rentals. Uh, we also do long-term leases on video equipment. And then the third part of what uh, the owner calls tri the trifecta is the academy. And the academy is what I'm mostly involved in. I do, I do uh, throw in my two cents when we're buying new equipment or we're going to go down a direction such as laser projectors or whatever. But my, my main focus is the academy, which is um, training for video technicians in the live event industry. Um, we have uh, our main our main training center is in Orlando, but we also now have a training center set up in Las Vegas, pretty much an identical match for what we're doing in Orlando. Um, and like I said, we're just training high-end video technicians uh, for the industry, for the live event industry on pieces of equipment that they otherwise wouldn't be able to learn except for on-the-job training in a ballroom. Um, and that's, awesome. that's kind of it in a nutshell. How do you go about training? Like, what type of specific um, equipment are the are people getting trained on, and and how do you get the who's training them exactly? You know, well, um, I have a team. There's myself and three other uh, teachers. Um, there's Tim Cushell, who's a former Barco engineer, and Eli Lofel, who is is our quality control manager here at the at the Evolve um, Media Group. And then Sean Sheridan, who's a longtime uh, freelance technician and is now um, my instructor for media servers and everything digital media. Um, the, way we've, the way I've broken it down is we have main areas of, of instruction. Um, and uh, I started it all off with just me teaching the classes. And it's gotten so large that I can't possibly teach all, the, all of them. 
Um, and the way the classes began is some of them I came up with the the uh, curriculum. For instance, we have a basic projection class, which is for mm -hmm. it, it's an intro to projection for people who have no experience with projection whatsoever. We give them the basics on on how projectors work, what you're trying to accomplish, how to stack projectors, how to converge projectors, and how to get a good image onto a screen. And then the another one that I I came up with was uh, projection warping and blending. And it's just a two day intensive course on nothing but blending and warping projectors. It's a boot camp, um, but it's a place where and we limit it to two to two people at a time. So the whole goal is to get as much hands on training as possible. I don't want people to have to go into a ballroom and try to learn how to do these really high level technical jobs which is the only way that people have been able to do it in the past. Clem, mm -hmm. I think you started out, you know, doing the same thing. You learned your projection <laughs> skills from trial and error in a ballroom. I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that is not fun. <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah, no, it's, Risky. no, it's not. And so we're trying to give them as much hands-on experience as we can. The other side of that is we have um, manufacturer certified training, such as Barco and Analog Way, with Barco, we're, in, we're a certified training center for the E2 image processing uh, uh, screen distribution system. And we're also, for Analog Way, we're a certified center for the Live Core platform, which is all of the ascender platforms. So we go to an extensive train the trainer with the manufacturer. <clears throat> we learn what they want taught, how they want it taught, so that all of the training is done the same way all the way around the world. Mm. And um, those are the certification trainings. So it's a mix of classes that I've concocted and then classes that the manufacturers have come up with. That's interesting. I wonder if almost uh, there's the technical training that you can get from the manufacturer, but then there's the experience training that you can get from, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, yourself and the other guys there, because it's one thing to know what the uh, where where in the menu you know this particular warp setting is or etc. It's another thing to be in a ballroom or to have been in a hundred ballrooms and sort of uh, seeing what the sort of range of options are in terms of uh, edge screens or what happens if your projector's hung you know at the wrong truss. Uh, and you're 10 feet off and how do you fix that and what are your little different uh, tips and tricks? So, I mean, are you guys doing that, Bob, too? Or are you guys essentially yes. uh, also giving that kind of like pro tip experience? Stuff? Yeah, all four of us have extensive um, live event um, experience. We've all been in the show industry. We've all done our fair share of shows and we've all had the the almost failures because we never have a, an actual failure. I don't at least. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think any Not one of my one. <laughs> guys has ever had a complete failure. We always manage to pull it out at the end so that the, the uh, you know, the people backstage may know that something's going on. But the people out in there who are the attendees and the end client, they don't know anything happened. And that's the whole goal. And uh, yeah. so far, we've been doing very well. Part of the instruction, as a matter of fact, is <clears throat> I call them our little bombs. We actually <laughs> build bombs into our training program so people have to troubleshoot mm, because that's awesome. troubleshooting nice. is a lost art in my opinion young people coming yeah. into this industry do not know how to troubleshoot and part of that reason is because the digital world has made it so much easier that they just don't they don't get it anymore and in the analog world the way we used to have to work there was a lot more troubleshooting involved because a lot more things happened uh, but nowadays that that's just not learned and it's not taught. So we we target troubleshooting as a main part of our instruction. You know what I can appreciate about that, Bob? A lot of the times people feel that if you're being if you're paying for a training and you're getting a training, then you don't have that real life experience. And by putting these bombs in there as you're describing them, that allows you to, to get some of that real life experience because when gear messes up or your computer isn't speaking with the equipment properly, all these little things can just come your way. And if you just have training, but not troubleshooting, 
experience, then you're lost. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, um, to that end, for several years now, even before I came to work for the Evolve Academy, I saw a real need for uh, young blood in the industry. There is no young blood coming into our industry and for many reasons, but I think the most prominent reason is because people just don't know what we do. Uh, I know when my kids were growing up, people would ask, what, what does your dad do? And my kids had no clue what I did. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of hard to describe to people what you do. So th yeah. th there's a definite lack of young blood coming into the industry. So I really wanted to start a program where we could take somebody maybe perhaps right out of high school or right out of a two year degree college program, or maybe somebody who's just gotten out of the military and, and they need a direction. And um, we're going to start a program in January in the Evolve Academy called the Trailhead Program. And if you think about it, a trailhead is just the beginning of a path. And so what we're going to try and do is create a path to a career for, for young people. <clears throat> and it'll be broken down into five disciplines that have to do specifically with video in live events. It'll be projection, signal flow, which will involve, you know, uh, image processing and how to get the signal actually to the screen, LED, um, uh, digital media, that'll be recording and playback, and then proper camera operation. So how to build a, a long lens camera and how to operate it and what to look for. And so this is something that's actually, uh, it looks like it's coming very close to happening. We Our target is in January. We're only going to have eight people in every class. It's eight weeks long. It's uh, two nights a week, three hours a night. <clears throat> and when a person graduates from the Trailhead program, I fully expect them to be able to step into a, a job, a position on a gig up to and including a small single screen show. Yeah. So that, yes. that's kind of a direction we're looking at right now. This is something I've been really working hard for for a long time. Wow. Wow. This is amazing, Bob. Like, I, I, as you're speaking, I'm just thinking about my, the beginning of my career. Yeah, you know, I've been in the industry mm -hmm. for 14 years and my mom was a still photographer. You know, I was part of, part of her, one of her passions. Um, in life. That wasn't her, her job, but that was her passion. So I kind of fell into television production um, in middle school, at church. I went to a special high school where I took two television production classes and then went on to Florida State in the College of Communications and learning how to shoot sports. And then in all of that, you know, I just kind of fell into one thing from to the next. You know, I thought I wanted to do new. Well, I knew I didn't want to do news. That wasn't the thing for me. Then I kind of fell into sports, even though I never played sports, but I just understood how to shoot sports. And then uh, Steve Ulmer, who I will forever be grateful, introduced me into the, you know, our industry and just kind of found my way into that and then was pushed into projection. It's just like all those things that just kind of fell into place. But to be able to, like you're saying, bring in that young blood and to give them that opportunity, expose them to something that can be great and change their lives. It's that's just a whole beautiful process. I'm excited to as you were describing it. Yeah. And, and um, from what you, exactly what you just said, you started in high school and I've had a lot of people ask me, well, you know, every high school has a TV studio nowadays. And so these guys can get guys and girls can get all the training they need in high school. And that's not necessarily the case because right. working in a studio, a television studio is not the same as working in a ballroom. Mm -hmm. It's 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 mm -hmm. a whole different world. And nobody that I know of teaches how to work in a ballroom. And right. so that's right. that's our goal. Well, you know, what's funny about that is, um, so my background's, you know, live video director, freelance, all that. But when I, I first got started, uh, working for like a, well, first for all church as well too. And I got, you know, shot straight to the top in terms of knowledge of how to direct and switch on like a, a pinnacle 9,000 video switcher or whatever it was. Old school. And, I love and, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, oh, I loved them too. They were doing the DVDs <laughs> and all that stuff. It was so sweet. But, um, you know, what's funny is I moved then, you know, uh, I finally got introduced to the, the sort of corporate events and live sh uh, show side. And I started to work for one of the larger kind of rental and staging companies here in Orlando. And the first show that they throw me on 
is some breakout room. I don't know, some some Disney hotel. And I've got a screen, a Barco Screen Pro one, like the old school one. And so it's like all this knowledge of whatever show and sort of directing cameras and all this didn't even matter. All right. Because I've got a, I don't even know what RGBHV is, right? What is five wire? Which colors go the right way? What is over Do under? I set the- Dude, it was so funny. I was working with Drew. Uh, Bro? What's his name? The projectionist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, he's technically on the show, my assistant. And I'm setting, I'm like totally faking it, right? And so I'm, I'm pretending to know everything. And so I'm setting up the screen pro at like the base of the stage. And he's going, what are you doing? Like you got to get set that up either backstage or you got to set it up at front of house or whatever it is. But he was just like, I didn't know anything. The basic fundamentals of like, what is a front of house? What is a, you know, backstage? What is video village? You know, cause I've been working in my own sort of knowledge and I agree with you on Bob, like you can go to TV production in school uh, or you can be working in a different side of the industry, like news or something like that. Who cares? Great. You've got general knowledge, but if you don't know the ballroom flow, right. And that sort of corporate event flow of load in over the course of a couple of days, setting up video village, where do you set up your tables? How are you forward thinking in terms of uh, your backstage uh, arrangement? Of, of, of cable trunks and all that stuff. It all has this like compounding effect on the course of your event. And often when we're on show site and it and we're getting tripped up, it's because either we have people who are new to the industry and they don't know what they're doing and they set something up wrong or whatever. And then also I'll second entirely your concept of throwing little bombs into <laughs> your training and academy because honestly, what was the last time you had a show big or small that didn't have broken gear. I mean, it's just sort of a right. fact of life, right? I mean, in terms of whether it's a fiber transmitter or receiver uh, or it's the main big, you know, sort of primary uh, equipment, which might be the projector itself. Yeah. One way or another, something's faulting there. Or you know and what? It's hey, balls, always go- to interrupt you real quick, real quick. It's yeah. not, sometimes it's not even the gear. The gear can be perfect. It could just be the scenario. Right. Something in right, the exactly. room is different. Like I just did a show okay. um, at UCF Arena and you know we're we're warping the whole bottom part of the bowl and we had our projectors aligned i'm done like i'm done warping i'm done grayscale it t- it did my day and a half of load in come to find out one of the chains from the motor was in the way it was in the shot and the client mm-hmm. didn't like it so what do we have to do we have to move the projectors all the way over to the side to get the the cone of light to get the chain out of the cone of light and now i've got to start my whole process over so that's another example of a bomb too not just the gear going bad that's a bomb on your evening because now you're working late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i got the, i got the whole idea for the for this um for wanting to get, bring young people into this uh, basically from training my son um mm. my son went to college on a football scholarship he when he got to college, he decided football wasn't any fun anymore. So he lost his scholarship when he quit college, came home, worked in a pizza joint. Then to give him some extra money, I got him on a, a gig as a breakout technician. And at the end of the week on that show, he said, Dad, this is what I want to do. You got to tell me how to do it. And so I started training him on different, on small pieces of equipment First, first thing I ever trained him on was a Prez Pro. Did anybody remember a Prez Pro? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But one of the very first things I taught him was how to troubleshoot. And now it's it's been five or six years, and and he has to turn down work. I taught him how to run the FSN. I, he took the E2 classes. And now he's all over the world doing shows. And as a matter of fact, like a third of his 2017 is already booked. So nice. there's a success story and I want some more of those success stories. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, And then uh, the problem solving things legit in terms of, uh, I mean, I don't know how many times you walk up on somebody and they're trying to figure out why, you know, the TV won't turn on and they're checking the gear, they're checking the playback, they're checking all. And it's like, 
is the TV on itself or is it plugged yeah. in? Like, is the power even plugged in? But that sort of uh, thing can consume hours. Oh, yeah. And you, you can assign a show tech or someone like that, even just a support guy who's just helping you load in that day. But without proper knowledge there, they end up wasting their time on projects that are useless. And now you as the video lead or you as the audio lead feel this pressure on you because it's three o'clock and, you know, you want to be up for rehearsals by five and you're sitting there going, where is everybody? And they're all getting wasted, you know, chasing their tail on stupid stuff. Right. So, and, um, it, and it always, the blame it, always real. goes on the most expensive piece of equipment on the show. It's got to <laughs> be the E2. It's got to be the spider. <clears throat> it's got to be, yeah. you know, one of those things. And it rarely is. No, it's the it's DA. usually, you know, there's a cable that hasn't been, you know, how many air gaps have you gotten where That's somebody exactly just forgot to plug in the cable? Or somebody yeah, kicked right. the power on a on a downstage monitor and it won't come on and guys are chasing around. But oh, it's got to be the E 2s fault or it's got to be the spider. It's not sending proper signal. Yeah. So those are some of the very important things that can be addressed and they can be taken care of very quickly if you just know how to what to look for. Now, Bob, I want to I want to address something because you you mentioned your son and and training him and that joy that success story and allowing people the opportunity to see more than they can imagine. You know, like I didn't, I, I would have never thought that this industry would have taken me to Barcelona for a nine day show, you know, and to, mm. to the Bahamas and all across the country and just the experience that I've had and meeting so many different people. How do you encourage people or how do you help people to see that by receiving training, by investing in yourself, you're investing in your future, you're investing in your life. Well, I, th I think what it comes down to is you have to identify um, what kind of work ethic a person has, has first. If somebody has a good, strong work ethic, I can teach them everything they need to know. And I've found, I mean, without fail, that if somebody's got a really good, strong work ethic and I show them what we do, and how we do it and all the opportunities that that this whole industry provides that it's something that they're very interested in and they want to move forward in um, not to say that you that somebody with a good strong work ethic can't go in a different direction i'm not saying that but what i'm saying is the first thing that i have to identify in somebody that i know is going to be a real success story is somebody that's going to work hard um, mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be pushing those cases in the beginning and they're going to be pushing those cases when they're where when they're really far into their career. You know, they're not just going to stand around and and let somebody else do all the work. Those are the people that are the most successful in the industry, I think. Yeah. So so, so understanding that the work never stops, the drive never stops, the the will to learn should never stop. Right. And, and, you know, when it, it you know, such little things in training help out so much, like when I tell people, OK, if you want to be a freelancer, then the number one rule is don't ever say no, because there's a right way and a wrong way to say no. But you don't ever want to say no. If somebody calls you and you've got a vacation planned, the right way to say it is, I'm sorry, I'm booked. Yeah, yeah. That's you, you can't say I'm sorry, I'm going on vacation because you'll never get called back. Hmm. So it's it's yeah. the little things that that I think somebody needs to teach people that they're not getting at this point. Now, uh, now, in regards to that, I mean, now, because I'm, I'm I'm I used to be of the you know I'm I'm booked or um you know or say no I can't because of that sometimes I'd get into personal stuff, but I've just kind of learned to say I'm not available. Exactly. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm just not available. It doesn't matter what it is. I could be sitting mm -hmm. on my back patio having a drink, you know, just relaxing. I needed yep. a day off because I've been working my butt off. I'm just not available. I would love to do your show. You know, thank you for calling me. I'm sorry that I'm not, I can't help you out, but I'm just not available. Yep. And, and what you've learned is not to, you don't say no. You say yeah. I'm not available. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a polite way of saying no that that labor coordinator out there is going to say, okay, well, if he's not available, that means he's already working on something else. I understand that. I'm going to move on to the next person 
but I'm going to come back to him because he still wants to work. If right. you just say, no, I can't do it, then you're not going to get called back again. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a different mindset, you know, having the, the um, I, want, I want to say younger generation, but just the people who are newer to the industry versus the ones that the seasoned veterans, if you will, you know, I'm not, I've been, like I said, 14 years, but you've been what 17 years in this industry and then 20 years in news before that, you know, there's something to learn from everybody. What, what would you tell somebody to help them with that work life balance? Um, well, um, (laughs) it, it truly is a young person's industry. Um, Mm -hmm. once you get to the point where you've been in it for a while, you, you, you tend to not want to travel as much because you got a family, you want to see them or you, or like you said, you just want to relax a little bit and maybe your day rate's gone up a little bit. So you don't need to work as hard as you used to, but if you're Mm -hmm. a young person and you're not tied down there, I can't think of too many better industries to be in than the, than the live event industry. Because it takes you all over the world, you get to do cool stuff, you get to see cool stuff, and uh, and it really is technically challenging sometimes. So it, your brain has to work, your body has to work, um, and then when you get a little older, you get to be my age, <laughs> you just you know the <laughs> traveling from site to site to site is not so important anymore as it was when I was young, and I and I love to do that. Yeah, traveling's not so bad anymore. But you know, when I get home and my wife says, "Well, let's go out to eat," and I was like, "Can, can I have a home cooked meal?" Like, <laughs> I've, I've eaten out so much now. Um, so I don't want so any that's chicken. another thing that's it's actually <laughs> no more chicken. Yeah, it's it's actually easy to target young people who aren't tied down to anything because there is this lure of doing a lot of stuff that's really cool. Yeah. Hmm. How much do you travel now, would you say? Well, um, I had an accident. I don't do shows anymore. Um, uh, Mm -hmm. The only shows, actual shows that I do is if I get a new piece of equipment or even a piece of equipment that I've been teaching for a while and it has a new upgrade. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, um, I I train E2 and I'm a certified instructor for the uh, E2 specialist and expert. But... um, a show came up and uh, linking had just been added to the E2. And if you don't know what linking is, it's it's the ability to tie two E2s together and use them in conjunction with each other. All inputs and all outputs work through both boxes. Well, it was a new process at that time, but we teach how to do linking. I had never done a linking show. So I took a show um, uh, that was a linking show where two boxes had to be linked together to do a show. And I actually asked, it was a rental company wanted to rent an E2, a couple of E2s from us. And I said, Hey, can I do that show for you? Because I want to experience it. And, and so that's really the only time that I do shows anymore. So my traveling is Orlando to Vegas to make sure that the the Vegas office is up and running. And uh, my traveling is, is pretty light these days. Yeah. That's funny. It's uh, sort of similar to me, although I'm not, uh, I didn't jump out at the very end of my career, but more so um, when I stepped out, ste- stepped away from doing shows and gigging as much and now entirely focused on show flow. It's, it's cool because I, I'm very engaged with the industry, but I actually only travel to gigs when um, there's a really like new way that they're trying to use the software. And I want to be a part of that to see that or experience it uh, sort of firsthand. Um, or even honestly more like when they come into Orlando and I'll just go visit people when they come on show site. But, um, and then actually, you know, thinking about that, uh, from the, your Academy side, I really, and I know Clint, actually all three of us on this call that really resonates with us because, um, you know, for teaching, you know, this industry, how to change its behavior, right. How to think differently. And I think often, uh, 
that's what you're talking about, right? When in terms of not just knowing uh, the pattern and the behavior is not just to show up and figure out the gear. Well, A, figure out what gear is coming out on show site when I get there and then sort of uh, sending it back or learning or calling a buddy on show site to figure out how to run it. But actually being forward thinking, being prepared, going and getting uh, properly trained or equipped and knowledge on how to handle that. That's huge. That's that's a big shift uh, in terms of uh, the way the industry traditionally has run. I run into that every single day. We do, you know, four or five uh, software demonstrations every single day of Showflow. And it's purely just in the aspect of like training, equipping, letting people know that there's even another way to do this. Uh, and that, that, so that's like actually a big, it's both the responsibility uh, that you have to take on if you want to get to where you want to go. And for you guys, you want to, I'm sure at Evolve, have go to, um, freelance and show techs that you know are properly trained and equipped uh, on your own gear, but then also on uh, how to handle the type of shows in the way that you would want them to handle. So that's a question back to you. Do you guys see that as sort of a self um, sort of equipping where you're almost filling your own freelance list with epic people that you know have gone through the Bob Murdoch or the Evolve sort of vetting process? Well, sort of. Um, We don't provide labor unless... Um, we, we have, we do, um, when we do a rental that is kind of like everything video on this show is coming from us, we'll send one position, one person to oversee everything. Or if we've got, mm-hmm. if there's major server presence where we're renting a lot of servers, but they, they don't really have the expertise or experience to run the servers, we'll send somebody out for that. But we're not a labor provider. But what I do keep is a list of people that I know are, you know, not everybody that comes to an E2 class is of the same caliber. And so I keep a list of the top 15 or 20 people that I think will do an, uh, an outstanding job on an E2 if somebody calls, because we get calls just about every day for recommendations for right. different people in different positions. And I can't put my mark on that if I don't truly believe that those people are are up to doing it. I can't just take a list of everybody that's gone through a like a projection warping and blending class and say, here's, here's everybody that's taken the class here, go ahead and try and find somebody. I'm going to take the top 10 or 15 people that I, that I think are the best. And then I'm going to send that list to them. Now, as people start to get more experience and start working up, maybe I can add them to that list. But in the beginning, if I don't know that they are really good at what they're doing, I'm not going to recommend them to anybody and put my name on it. You know, Bob, as you say that, I love, I love what you were, where you were going there. As a projectionist, you know, I, I think about how I was trained. You know, people took me under their wing and they saw something in me. They appreciated my work ethic and they were happy when I was on their sh- a show with them. Um, and one thing that I tell a uh, sis that I'm working with and, you know, a little project- projectionist that I might be training to, to be better is that, you have to be a great projection assist before you can be a projectionist. You have right. to be able to anticipate what I need before I ask you for it. That way, that shows me that you're already thinking as a projectionist. You're already forward thinking. You're looking at the show completely different. You're looking at our task, what we need to accomplish, completely different, in a completely different mindset. And you're meeting me where I already am. And once you can, once you have somebody that you know is taking those extra efforts to understand what's going on and why we do things and how it can be done, maybe even more efficiently, that's when you can say, I trust this person to go out on a show and to do this job. I can recommend, I can put my name on this person because I've seen them work. They've worked under me. I know they'll do a good job for you. And and that and that's the key. I mean, you're putting your name on on the line. You're you're recommending somebody, and if you don't have the, if you don't really have aren't comfortable with that, then you shouldn't be doing it. Because I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put my name on anybody that I don't know for a fact is going to do a good job. And and on the on the flip side of that, I've taken people off my list too because they got a little bit too comfortable. And I've heard some bad things about them. You know, they're getting a little bit lax 
And, and I, I don't just take them off the list. I call them and I tell them because I don't think it's fair to to for me to take them off of my recommendation list unless I let them know why. Mm. That's huge, actually, uh, having some accountability for what people do. I think often uh, I would see and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be. Uh, I wouldn't be honest if I wasn't saying it myself. There are gigs sometimes you snooze through, you know, or it's like you kind of just do your best uh, or maybe the minimum amount. And that's cool. I mean, people get into funks and, and, and that's, that's you know, that does happen. And that's that just sort of comes with the whole deal. But honestly, uh, there should be some accountability to that. Just because I saw you do one big arena show four years ago doesn't mean you're – uh, at the caliber still today. And so, if, I mean, really right now, that's more of sourced through the community, right? Uh, right. Have you heard that, you know, what's his name has been a little sl- uh, sluggish or he shows up, you know, um, unprepared often or whatever. And it's like, oh, I wonder what's going on with him. Um, but I could see that certainly in your role, I actually get it all the time. We are always, you know, show flow, we've got like seven or 8,000 freelance show techs that are in our system. We're always getting asked, Hey, who would you recommend for this? Who would you recommend for that? And I'm sitting there going, all right, well, when was the last time I actually worked with Clem? Hmm. Maybe the word on the street is Clem showing up drunk every day. Maybe, maybe I don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Don't put that on me. Don't you put that on me. Don't put that. (laughs) Ricky Bobby. (laughs) Clem, I thought you were going to stop that. (laughs) Yeah. Shame on you, Clem. But yeah, I guess you guys understand a little bit what I'm saying. They're just uh, technically, you know. You could say someone knows or has done the role, um, but are they really abreast on either the latest technology, right? So just because you're a projectionist doesn't mean you can handle a warp show, uh, et cetera. And I don't know. I think, you know, whether or not Showflow solves it or a combination of everybody one day, I do think this industry is jonesing for some sort of um, – maybe some sort of measurement based system, you know, to where you can be like, all right, here, I've been vetted by these 16 different sources or places. And so, yeah, I can claim that I'm a warp projectionist who's done, who's at X level, you know, as far as experience. um, And that's sort of qualified through these different, uh, you know, places. So, and I think what you're doing there at Evolve is basically one of those first passes where it's like, well, listen, I've got the stamp of Evolve's class A, B, C, and D. So right there, that's good. I'm going into the industry with that level of sort of, uh, accreditation already. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. And we're, um, uh, in our, our certification classes, we have to give tests. So we make sure that we test everybody to find out a written test and a practical test to make sure that they know what they've learned in the last two or three days. And with the trailhead program, it's going to be the same way. If they can pass a test at the end of the course and the test will be setting up an entire single screen show on their own, if they can do that, then they'll, they'll get their diploma and they'll graduate from the evolved trailhead program. Mm -hmm. If not, then they're not going to be certified by the Evolve Academy as having completed the course. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's plain and simple. I I don't think people should be able to just say, hey, I took the course at the Evolve Academy, so here I can do it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I have a responsibility on this end to make sure that they just didn't sit there and, and read their telephone for the two days while they were here, and they don't have anything, and they have no clue how to operate the equipment. So testing is a huge part of what we do. Yeah. One last question. How, how would you, yeah. how, how would you, if somebody has been in the industry, should they then consider taking a class or something like that? You know, if they've already quote unquote, feel mm-hmm. like they're certified, they're working, they're good. Why would they maybe consider a class? Most of the people who are in the industry and have been working in it for a long time come to specific classes to learn new, either new pieces of equipment or um, get trained on maybe some things that they don't really know what it can do. Um, we have a class going on today in the uh, live core for Analog Way in the Ascender program uh, that there's a guy in there that's been working with on an Ascender for several years but he came to the class so he could learn stuff that he didn't know what it would that it would do. Mm-hmm. And so we get that kind of stuff. But then 
uh, the majority of the people who've been in this industry for a while, it's like um, uh, I just had a, an, a whole class of projectionists that were sound guys. And they're like, hmm. I don't want to do sound anymore. I want to get into the video side of it. it. I think projection is what I want to do. I think I want to take that projection class. And then at the end of the class, all four of them were, were really good. And they had a lot of experience on the audio side of it. So I knew that, that they've done shows and they know what they're doing. And when they could um, show me that they actually learned from the class. So at the end of the class, they were able to do everything that I showed them how to do. I actually recommended all four of them to a gig. I got a call from a local company that needed three uh, projectionists. Each one would only have to do, uh, they'd have, they have three rooms each, not really breakout rooms, but small meeting rooms, single screen, set up the, the pr projector and, and that would be their job. And it's in Austin, Texas. So I gave all four of those guys names to the, uh, to the company and they booked three of them. Nice. So, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a progression type of thing. And, and those kind of guys that I know that are really going to take it seriously and, and they want to change direction of what they're doing or just learn something new. I'm happy to, to try and help them out any way I can. That's awesome. Well, uh, Bob, we got to wrap. This has been amazing, man. This is fun. Uh, I, I'm just highly impressed a with how much you're owning this. Uh, it's something that matters. And, uh, so I think a just congratulations and thank you to you and to your team over there at Evolve is, uh, this, this is absolutely what this industry needs. And, um, also, you know, just again, speaking from Clem and I personally, I just know that this is something that, you know, uh, we care a lot about. It's how do you, um, not just sort of show up from an up for another gig, but how do you actually, um, help influence? How do you pass on knowledge to the next uh, round of people? How do you help uh, move yourself personally up uh, or into different roles throughout this industry? Because I think often people get burnt out if, you know, they're slugging, uh, you know, uh, road cases around at 19 and uh, and then maybe 50 years later, they're still doing that. I mean, that's just not realistic. That's not that's not fun. And, and that's, I don't think anybody's actually aiming for that and wants that. And so being able to show us the different ways that you've moved around that, that's, that's been cool. So I appreciate you, Bob. Thank you so much for joining us today. Much love. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> um, well, Clem, dude, thank you. Uh, this is another one, another production channel podcast, and uh, it's just been a blast. For anyone out there, again, reminder, uh, we're going to be uh, you know, doing these all the time. And so if you know of somebody, uh, if you know of a story yourself, if there's a way that you, uh, sort of that you interact with this industry that's unique or awesome, uh, please reach out to Clem or myself. Really, these things are for the industry. It's to help uh, enlighten uh, show techs in corporate events what it looks like to do broadcast news for people in sports production to know what it looks like to do corporate events uh, and around so this thing's really built for us and for the industry and so um, but with that we'll uh, wrap for today and tune in next week but thank you so much for tuning in to the production channel peace